This first scene was essentially to set up Padme and uh, the fact that she's now a senator and the fact that there is an attempt on her life, which is the sort of pseudo plot going forward here, which is what I hang most of the story on in terms of getting Padme and uh, Anakin together and then sending Obi-Wan off on this uh, mystery of who's trying to kill her. But that is all kind of a red herring because ultimately what we really want to find out is about the clones and the clone army and ultimately leading to the Clone War. The first real scene in the movie uh, is with Palpatine and the Jedi. And it's primarily designed to set up the fact that the Jedi are having a hard time uh, keeping uh, peace and justice in the galaxy and that they aren't really designed as an army. They're designed as a, a kind of police force and diplomatic corps. And I just needed to remind the audience here that uh, that the Jedi aren't really there aren't enough of them really to conduct a full-scale war, which is something that is more or less unknown in the in the uh, galaxy at this point. Uh, the, when the Pro Republic came into being, war was, they pretty much ended all the wars uh, because of the Senate and the doing things through negotiation. The beginning scenes are all usually uh, technical scenes that get everybody together and get the plot sent off on the right path. In this case, I had to get Anakin and uh, Obi-Wan into the film. So the, the ultimate point of this scene here is to have Palpatine suggest that the Jedi protect the uh, senator. The other part of this is that Palpatine's maneuvering things and getting Obi-Wan and Anakin to be with the queen again. And part of it is to get Obi-Wan to find the clones and find the clone army which is what part of this setup is for. Because they're being led along this path, the Jedi, toward accepting a clone army and, and for Palpatine to get powers beyond the ones that uh, are the constitutional powers for an elected official. He wants to have sort of more, more all-encompassing powers of which an emergency allows him to have. Pretty much most of their scene after this is rather tense, which is set up to show the frustration that Anakin is feeling with being held back by Obi-Wan. We set up Jar Jar on this one. Being from Naboo, the most obvious thing is that he would be part of the senator's entourage. So he's a, not really a senator, but a representative of the Gungans in the Senate from Naboo, which ultimately becomes more of a plot point. Whenever you're doing a film, the first act is sort of laying pipe for the rest of the movie. So we have to establish certain situations that will eventually pay off later. And in this case, Anakin's sensitivity to his mother and her plight is used later. And I'm trying to move that part of the exposition forward while at the same time I'm uh, trying to develop the suspense of the assassin about to kill Padme and wondering whether uh, you know R2 will wake up in time. Some of these things you sort of set up the the premise of you know how do I how am I going to assassinate the the senator and then you come up with an idea and that idea then leads to uh, a whole sequence. In this case, um, uh, part of it was I wanted to have these creepy crawlers. I thought that'd be kind of spooky and scary. And then uh, with the droid. Um, it just sort of presented itself that Obi-Wan would do this ridiculous bravado stunt and jump out and grab the droid and hang on to it to try to find out where it was going. And uh, it's that because that's the only evidence he has of who is behind this assassination plot. Um, and it led to a sequence that uh, is exciting and also uh, presented some some fun moments between Anakin and Obi-Wan, which shows them as a team. And having it be so casual makes it kind of funny. This was a very difficult scene conceptually because we had to really move around a very large city, which we hadn't done before, which means we had to go through different kinds of districts. Uh, you know, the business district, the industrial district, the entertainment district, and they all had to have a sufficiently different look. So, um, but not so f different that you look like you were on sort of different planets or something. It's easier to reveal character under stress and how they approach it. And it also makes for an exciting sequence. When the bounty hunter died, 
it occurred that it would be more interesting if she was a changeling and when she died, she went back into her original form. Um, just to add a little bit of bizarreness to this world we live in, we're always looking for a little edge to make things different and um, kind of off center. You can see that Palpatine is sort of boosting his ego to make him feel that he's better than possibly he really is. A lot of his philosophies and things are uh, repeated later on by Anakin when he gets into situations about how he should be allowed more freedom, more assignments. Then we contrast that with the three Jedi and, and show Obi-Wan's concern about the fact that his apprentice is getting ahead of himself and he's arrogant. And Obi-Wan is kind of put down a little bit by Yoda there because Yoda says that that arrogance exists in the older Jedi too, which is a way of warning Obi-Wan that he may be suffering the same hubris. The, the functional part of this scene is for Obi-Wan to find out where this particular toxic dart came from. Originally, we had a, another scene before this, which had some analysis droids who couldn't figure it out. And so he came here to find out the answer. But ultimately, I realized that the two scenes were redundant and repeated themselves. And so I felt this was the better of the two scenes. Uh, because later on, we go back to the Jedi Temple, to the library, and um, get uh, the sense of sort of arrogance on the part of the Jedi in terms of if they think they know everything. But in this case, this cafe owner knows more than the what's in the Jedi Library. I also like the fact that Obi-Wan's got a lot of friends in the galaxy. He's got a lot of contacts, a lot of un unorthodox ways of doing things. So he's not just the sort of straight-laced, do-it-by-the-book guy uh, that he has a tendency to be around Anakin. Cloners, are they friendly? This is a scene also that introduces the idea of cloners and uh, is the first indication that there's something more at foot here than just uh, trying to track down a bounty hunter who's trying to assassinate a senator. The scene in the library is designed to bring out this plot point that someone in the Jedi Order has been hiding this whole idea that the cloners have been building an army for the Republic. And the reason that nobody knew about it for so long is because they had erased the whole system from the Jedi archives. I wanted to do a scene with Yoda. There's one of these little issues about how is it that everybody's trained by Yoda, but it also serves the function of solving this mystery about the fact that there's some mysterious Jedi or person who has kind of sabotaged the library, uh, which is um, another part of the mystery. This is a chance for me to play with that sort of more mischievous side of his character uh, and get away from the sort of official, serious kind of Yoda that ends up in the Jedi Temple with, you know, on the Jedi Council and that sort of thing where he really isn't allowed to, to be as fun and, and sort of tease people. So in this environment with the kids, he was, he's, he's able to lighten up a little bit, which I really wanted to do for his character because it's very much more what his character is in, in the other movies, especially in, in Empire Strikes Back. I tried to keep the love story below the surface so that it's not something that they're articulating, it's something that they're feeling. Because we have a big scene coming up later where he is able to articulate the whole situation. It's a little tricky because it means that to, you have scenes that are inactive in what is in essence a very active movie. I did the same thing in The Empire Strikes Back and I was very nervous about it then, but I had this kind of training session, this kind of philosophical dog leg with Yoda on the planet where I was just sitting around talking about philosophy and the force and things like this. Uh, at the same time, the action was going on in the movie and intercutting those two things. So I used the same technique here where I have a rather passive story, a love story, and then I contrast it in this case, rather than with an action kind of piece, it's more of a mystery action kind of piece. It's, there's as much mystery going on as there is action. The scene in the Queen's Chambers establishes again that there is another queen and that uh, Padme reports to her and that this issue of the army is something that could push the Republic into war and that there's a possibility that this is all going to end in a war. It also counters some of the softness that we've had in the scene between Anakin and Padme before, which is slightly romantic. Padme now reasserts her 
authority over Anakin. And we see that we're sort of going back and forth between them as two young people uh, having feelings for each other to her position as a senator and his position as a Jedi Knight. And so in their official capacities, they have a tendency to be slightly abrasive with one another and sort of conflict with who's in charge. She's constantly able to sort of establish her strength in this situation and keep him in his place. I think ultimately the overriding factor on the uh, on Obi-Wan's ship and all of the Jedi ship is that I wanted them to be reminiscent of the design of the Star Destroyers and the Imperial ships because ultimately that's where those ships grew out of, out of the, the former guardians of uh, peace and justice in the universe, which were the Jedi. And I didn't particularly want uh, for, you know, thematic reasons for that to shift. I wanted to keep that wedge-shaped design. The scene of finding this mysterious planet, which was missing in the archives, we will now find out why it was erased. Obviously, Obi-Wan is here trying to find out where the bounty hunter is, and he stumbles into something completely different. And so he kind of has to play along with this charade that he came for another reason and try to figure out what that reason is and then be shocked by the fact that it's an army. These uh, characters, the comedians, I wanted to do a little tip of the hat to Steven in uh, Close Encounters to use a more traditional alien the kind that everyone says, come on the spaceships that land here on Earth, and deal with a much more sophisticated society than anything we've seen before that looks different, that is operating on uh, a level that's even beyond that of Coruscant. And uh, I wanted it to be a water planet because water is where life began, and in this case, this is a, a place where these people create life in the form of uh, clones. I all, also wanted to always keep this Obi-Wan part of the story is a mystery of a constantly unraveling uh, mystery of new things coming in and him trying to figure out how all the pieces fit together. That entire sequence was shot in blue. So uh, it really had to be created completely digitally because I wanted to create a completely different environment. I wanted it to be kind of a very slick and very, very ultra modern. There, there is a surreal look to it that is created by the use of reflection and blown out light and a lot of hot surfaces. When you get into a set that, that is that complex, it's very hard to do it any other way because of the subtlety of the way the light is blown out and the kind of ethereal otherworldliness of it. You know, it's not very concrete. It's all kind of white on white on flare on lots of flares, lots of burned out areas. I wanted to establish one that since it's only been 10 years since the last movie and this movie, that we have growth acceleration so we can get these clones to be 20 years old. They're old enough to be soldiers. And that I wanted to tell this little story of Boba Fett, you know, that there was a relationship between stormtroopers and Boba, but ultimately Boba would have been too old. So I made him Boba's father, which was the clone that started the stormtroopers. Obviously, he is struggling with a lot of emotions uh, in playing with her and talking to her and being charming. She's beginning to see him as a, an attractive young man, but they've already decided in that very first awkward scene that they weren't going to go there with that first kiss. But obviously, that kiss has opened up a whole set of underlying feelings that they can't get rid of that will be... Uh, dealt with later on here. We're constantly playing with them, trying to uh, trying to connect in a romantic way, but you know her not giving into it, even though you can see that she's struggling just like he is. You know, but I wanted a lot of the 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 connections to be going on under the surface, and then only occasionally sort of reveal themselves rather than being constant through the whole movie where they're constantly talking about their relationship. They go from being friends and having fun and then they re they reveal themselves and they go back to being sort of professional and, and her caring about him and some of his suffering when it comes to the mother and her compassion toward him. But I keep the, the romantic part again uh, locked down for a while and sort of below the surface. He does realize that, yes, this would not be a good idea because it would jeopardize my career, jeopardize her, and it probably wouldn't be a good thing. Scene with Obi-Wan leaving Kamino is 
again, one of those scenes that is putting the plot together, which is the fact that whoever ordered this army, nobody knows about it. It's a complete mystery, uh, which is, I think, uh, one of the key issues. But he's also reporting back saying that he's found the bounty hunter that was trying to kill Padme. And it's, you know, it's a, it's a bit of a mechanical scene in that um, it's basically him getting permission to go after Jango Fett. And uh, at the same time, it allows us to establish that neither Yoda nor Mace nor the Jedi Council had any idea about this um, clone army. And the further idea that the Jedi, their uh, ability to use the Force is diminishing. It's established very early on in the very first scene where Yoda says, you know, the dark side has clouded everything. But an idea that that's important and that complex really needs to be said a couple times. And the fact that as the dark side grows, it clouds their vision. They're very concerned that people find out that they're losing their abilities, uh, that it, uh, it wouldn't help the situation of the separatist movement and all the other things that are going on because it's a very tense situation and the Jedi are completely outnumbered in terms of trying to keep control of the situation. It turned out to be a rather exciting sequence. We had very little set to work with and uh, once they go over the edge, it gets very complicated. Most of it's actually animated. It doesn't look like it, but it is. There are lots of little inside gags in the movie. You know, for people that actually know Star Wars well and get connections, so there's a little bit of a Where's Waldo in all of this just for the fun of it, and we enjoy doing it, I enjoy doing it. Bloody Some of the film, you know, ultimately ends up writing itself once you get through the first third of the film. If Anakin is gonna go after his mother, then the first place you'd have to go would be Watto because that's where we left her. So that necessitates that we have a scene between Anakin and Watto where Watto reveals where she is or takes you to the next step. In this kind of situation, it uh, a lot of the script almost writes itself in terms of what scenes have to follow. Otherwise, you would just be jumping too fast through the story. I wanted to also vary the types of danger. We start with a kind of uh, depth charge that is different from lasers and anything else we've ever used, which gives an exciting piece as it crunches through the, the asteroids. And it, it gives a nice, it's also a nice visual sequence. Uh, then eventually we get into our normal dogfight. Uh, in order to do that, I had to figure out a way of getting Django behind Obi-Wan. So I had to get them to switch places, which the little sequence inside the asteroid uh, allowed me to do. And then I was able to get to the traditional dogfight and then play a little bit of the joke of the fact that Obi-Wan doesn't like to fly uh, and use a different kind of laser that's, that's you know, much more rapid fire than anything we've seen before. And then ultimately the third part of this, we used a rocket. A lot of these action set pieces and everything, I break them down into two or three little pieces. Each one has its own story and each one is sort of different and varied from the other. Whether it's the fight on the uh, Camino landing platform whether it's this, all of them have little beginnings, middles, and ends. Whenever you're doing an action set piece, you have to keep it varied. You have to keep it alive and fresh. You can't just keep doing the same thing over and over again. And you have to have a build. You know, usually you have a start kind of slow and then build to something very, very intense. You put the most intense thing at the end and the least intense thing in the, in the beginning. Soap operas do things like this, where you have stories that go and intermingle and go on and on, but they don't do it backwards. You're making a film that you're supposed to see in order, but you've made it backwards. <laughs> I don't think anybody's done that before. I don't know why anybody would. <laughs> I tried in this particular set of sequences to kind of merge the two stories together visually so that you get a sense that they're both going on searches and trying to resolve mysteries and it has to do a lot with, in Anakin's case, a pending flaw in his character, and in Obi-Wan, what you could only describe, I guess, as a flaw in the system, which is uh, Count Dooku. This is how we introduce Count Dooku. I do it very vaguely, very off, very offhanded, and very bits and pieces. And I really save the, the real scene with Count Dooku for later on in the prison, 
uh, where he confronts Obi-Wan. So I've tried to be reasonably coy about it here, even though I do show him. Uh, I do need to establish who he is. I do need to establish this situation with the treaties and that sort of thing in order to move the plot along. But um, I've tried to be as, uh, as circumspect about it as possible. Obviously, everything hinges on political issues. Fortunately, I was able to deal with most of the political issues and get them all set up and explained in Phantom Menace. So in this one, it's much easier to kind of, in just a few sentences, sort of follow what the political story is. And we don't have to go into quite the detail and the complications that we did in the first film. So now we're at night, and again, it's the same kind of stalking on a desert planet, only now it's Anakin stalking the Tusken Raider camp instead of Obi-Wan stalking the Geonostian termite hill. But I played these so they'd be sort of visually reminiscent of each other. The scene with Obi-Wan is primarily a, you know, again, a functional scene. We have to have Obi-Wan realize that Anakin has gone from one planet to another planet. And then we have to set up the fact that he's being watched, so he's in danger. But we do have to get a message back to the council and this is a functionary device to get the message back to the council about Django Fett and about the uh, trade treaties and things that are being made and to include Anakin and Padme in this process so that everybody's sort of tied together. It's kind of hard when you get all your characters on different planets in the galaxy to have a way of connecting them up so that they're all part of the same pieces of information at the same time. But this does allow me to have a little bit of a include R2 and give him something to do and make him a pivotal character. It's very hard when you're making a film with so many characters to give them all something to do because the plot usually revolves around a, a few of them, but not all of them. And then they all have functions. They're little functions, but they're functions. You know, in this one, R2 and Jar Jar and 3PO, you know, have things to do, but, and there's some of them are very critical to people being saved and everything, but just that the story isn't really about them. He's uh, very unhappy about that. I mean, he's you know, very sad and depressed. There's a, there was some dialogue here before that I took out because it seemed to get in the way of the emotional moment of this scene where she says to be angry is to be human, and he says, but it, to control your anger is to be a Jedi. And so that issue is, was, was actually laid out in in dialogue at one point and I decided to sort of pull back from it because it seemed to me that it was pretty obvious that was what was there and I didn't think I needed to state it quite as boldly as I did and uh, that issue will come up at a later time and I just felt it took away from the moment of his sadness and I thought the sadness pretty much said the same thing without words but I was able to get in this little thing if you put two Sith together and they try to get others to join them to get rid of the other Sith. So Doku's ambition here is really to get rid of Darth Sidious. And he's trying to get Obi-Wan's assistance in that and help in that so that he and Obi-Wan could overthrow Sidious and take over. And it's exactly the same scene as when Darth Vader does it with Luke to try to get rid of Sidious. So whenever you get too many people together with these Sith Lords, they all gang up and they all try to get rid of the strongest one and then they'll try to get rid of each other. So the one facet of the Sith reality is that they're constantly plotting against each other and therefore there can't be more than two of them at any time. This is one of the more, I think, boldly revealing scenes in terms of what is happening on the political front and the movement of Palpatine to total control and authority over everybody, which is leading toward the evolution of the Empire and the evolution of the Emperor. This crisis has been created and the only solution is to give him more power and Jar Jar becomes the dupe making that proposal that allows him to have that power. And even the Jedi are there. The Jedi aren't really allowed to be involved in the political process. They're there, but they can't suddenly step up and say, no, 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 you can't do that and stuff. They have to let the political process go. This is one of those. And it allowed me to have a little bit more humor with R2 and 3PO, which circumstances hadn't really permitted too much of that old fashioned kind of R2 and 3PO banter back and forth and humor. I needed an action piece here. It became a perfect environment for a chase and you know, machines crushing things. And uh, it was fun. We, we shot this in like a day and a half on a conveyor belt. 
and then put it together later and this is one of those where ILM just did an amazing job and the videomatic department you know upstairs from the editing rooms you know put this together and it was just super because all we did was cut a bunch of blue screen shots together it turned into a very exciting sequence now that I have the technical capabilities, I can do the moves later. So I can do matched moves on three or four shots in a row, which allow me to do a, a particular kind of style that's developed where I'm able to keep the camera moving subtly, but through things. Normally it's a little hard to do that because it's hard to time the zooms, but now I can time the zooms to go through three or four shots in a row and just pick it up from one shot to the other. And um, I do do that quite a bit now, especially in action sequences or you know, I can use the stop of the zoom to make a dramatic point rather than to just sort of have one zoom shot and then go to a regular shot. I can go to zoom, 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 and then when I go to the regular shot, the shock of the zoom stopping means something. This whole uh, droid factor becomes a kind of uh, montage in the tradition of silent movies. It also allowed me to uh, bring R2 in and let him, through his little Swiss Army knife reality, save the day again which I always like to have R2 do at least once in every movie. He's the, the stalwart, unsung hero of the Star Wars films. I had one cut of the film where they came and actually just walked in the front door, met with Count Dooku, had a diplomatic argument with him and negotiated with him, and then were put on trial and sent off to the execution arena. But it just didn't work in the overall flow of the movie. We finally get to the arena which is the beginning of the last really big, long section. I mean, the droid factory was one part of it, but um, it's broken up with this little love theme or this little moment where Padme finally gives in and reveals that she actually does love Anakin. And in the face of death and the face of the fact that this is all going to be over, she does succumb to her emotions. She does let down the sort of social barriers that have been put up and, you know, practical reality of what would happen to them in the future if they were to let their emotions run wild. And so feeling that fate is going to finish them off anyway, she lets herself go and they fall in love, which brings a lot of consequences later. But she, had, at this point, they have no idea they're going to actually be rescued in this. So this is sort of their last word, so to speak. The arena has been broken into a bunch of sections. We have the, what we call the monster fight, which is the monster execution, which is the first section. And then that leads into the Jedi fight, which is the when the Jedi arrive and we have a big battle. And then we have the third section, which is the, the what we call the Clone War, which is when Yoda arrives with the clones and that battle. And then it finally ends in a, in a sword fight uh, with uh, Count Dooku, a more personal uh, battle. It's really three very large action sequences set one after the other, uh, with nothing in between them. So this was structured this way in the script. The, the droid factory was added, so it added a sort of a fifth one. But it was really designed that from the moment they had that love scene, that the whole movie just sort of shot along. And then we have this little denouement at the end where we sort of tie everything up. That one last little check in with everybody that has the last revelations and things. This was fun. It's sort of the Rancor pit, only done in broad daylight and done with lots of different creatures and done with an audience. And, you know, before, I couldn't even think of doing something on this scale, you know, in an arena. When we did the pod race, it was the first time we were able to do a, you know, a crowd and that sort of thing. So now suddenly I can do crowds and arenas. And so I can think about things like, like this. And we were able to have some funds there. This scene here with Obi-Wan and the crab is our Ray Harryhausen homage. This is a, a leap forward of being able to put Anakin on the back of the reek and have it jump around. We're able to use some actual digital, digital Anakins uh, and, and, um, and Obi-Wans and uh, Padme's. This is where we took a long time, lots of second units shooting individual Jedi doing actions that then were placed meticulously back there one at a time. You know, it's like paste on kind of fighting. So there's a lot of shooting in this sequence to get to even one shot. And you end up with lots of little pieces, lots of ideas, some of the ideas you can't use. And obviously lots of people are coming up with little bits and pieces. Wouldn't it be funny if, and what about this? And 
you know, you get a lot with the animators and with, you know, like Ben shooting second unit or cutting, you know, we do the little group that's in the center of things is constantly trying to do little asides and jokes and come up with things. But why didn't Django just run away like he normally does? You know, that's what he's got the rocket pack for, but his rocket pack was damaged. And so that's why Mace was able to kill him because he was expecting to fly away and he didn't. It makes him look less impotent because he is Jango Fett after all. And he is powerful. Mace is powerful, but Jango Fett is too. The Twilight Jedi is something that came a little later. When we started building Jedis, we had a lot of Jedis and uh, we needed more and more Jedis. As we were doing them toward the end, we ended up with a lot of Jedis that looked like people that worked at ILM. You know, with these short little haircuts and looked like they stepped out from behind a computer. And so I was saying, we have to get more exotic Jedis. And so we would we only have so much resources to do these things with, but I do have Twi'leks because we use them quite a bit in other areas in the Senate and as background action. So I have a sort of a, a wardrobe and a setup of certain kinds of characters. So it was a way of reinventing some of those characters. And I had realized that uh, we had a comic book that, that has a Twi'lek in it that is a Jedi. There's a whole series actually of her. And I said, well, why don't we put her in this? I mean, she's, you know, she's a comic character, but we'll just fit her in and uh, have her be a background character because that's exotic. And that's how the Twilight Jedi ended up in the backgrounds of these shots was to try to use some of the, the work and effort that the guys in the comic book world had put into things and characters they had created. One of the nice things was in the droid factory. Once we got in the droid factory, all these fun ideas came up about 3PO getting a droid head put on him and you know doing that kind of thing. And then it's we're able to pay it off here in the battle by having R2 come to 3PO's rescue by putting him back together again. In the story, there isn't really a big Jedi battle until the Clone War. Even if I'd wanted to do it, I couldn't. Until I got the digital technology, I couldn't really do a scene like this. You know, so I really had to wait until we sort of advanced to the point where I could tell this story. And, uh, you know, made the commitment, obviously, on Phantom Menace that I was going to get there somehow. And I say it was the experiment of Phantom Menace that got us to this point where I could think about doing something like this. But on Phantom Menace, we had to invent all these droids and make these droids happen and figure out how to do that and create the droid army. And, you know, it's just a huge amount of work went into that, that we didn't know how we were going to do it or whether it was going to work. And now then we had that. Now we can then add the Jedis in, you know, but you can't do it... Um, you know, it was just impossible to do it all at once. This whole scene in the in the uh, control room was added later because I realized when I cut the film together, we'd lost sight of Doku after he leaves the arena and what happened to him and everything. So in one of my reshoots, which I do, and I, you know, I set out time to do reshoots, to look at the movie and say, oh, I need something here, I need something here. It's just the way I, part of the process that I work under. I added this whole scenes with uh, Doku and uh, decided we put a hologram version of the battle going on there. But that comes organically out of when you start to see the whole movie and the battle put together and you can sort of watch it. And you can say, oh, we need to be able to have this there and now I can see this here. Because there's so much going on and it is so complicated that until you can actually see it, and it is so visual, that you need to see it visually before you can actually begin to see what's missing. The idea of the Death Star being added in there does sort of add a continuity that goes all the way through to four, which I liked. And once you begin to put things together, you begin to see how you can draw lines and connect things and make them have more continuity from picture to picture. The whole issue of where these clones came from, who set this whole thing up and everything is, you know, purposely not revealed in this film. But it's hopefully downplayed enough to where you're not frustrated or upset if you don't know what's going on. We also introduced the idea of the fact that somebody named Tyrannus is involved in this clone situation. We don't know who Tyrannus is, and we don't really find out until the end of the film, um, which again plays a pivotal part in the next film. Getting all the characters to have their job during the war and then having them all come back together again at the end was a little complicated because there's so much going on. But by putting Count Dooku in a separate hangar to take off on an interstellar ship allowed me to have our heroes see him and then Yoda sense what is going on and then have them ultimately end up all in the same place, which is in the climactic sword fight. At one time, I was going to have them both fight him at the same time, but that didn't really seem to work as well as me doing each one individually. This is what we've been waiting for. After Anakin is defeated and Yoda comes, I took a completely different route with this sword fight. 
we had all these controversies about whether this was going to work and could Yoda actually fight, you know, a two-foot frog fight, a six-foot two Sith Lord. And um, I started out doing it fairly conservatively where he just came and fought. That really didn't work. And it was actually, um, uh, you know, Ben Burt and John Knoll and a bunch of the people sort of in editorial and, and ILM were saying, you know, we got to make more out of this. You know, you got you to use Jedi powers and you got to, you can't just go right into the sword fight. So I decided to go back to the Empire Strikes Back of throwing things at each other, even though I knew they were equal to each other. So it was a hopeless gesture and they would have figured that out in two seconds. But for the audience, it actually, it's nice for them to go through this process of everybody throwing everything around. Then with the blue lightning bolt kind of things that we had from the Emperor that he used against Anakin, the fact that he used them against Yoda, but Yoda is not affected by them, that Yoda has come to a level beyond. Anakin doesn't know how to deal with it. Obi-Wan uses his laser sword to stop it. Yoda can actually just use his hand, and uh, which makes him much more powerful, and say that none of that stuff's gonna work on me. So that then we were able to build to the sword fight and then have the surprise of the fact that he can just jump all over the place. And I was sort of depending on that surprise. I very much like the idea, which is continuing from Empire Strikes Back when you first see him, is he's this funny little green frog living in the uh, swamps. And then eventually you realize that this is a great Jedi master. Well, in this sequence, it's the same idea. You have this funny little wizened old man who's very old and walks with a cane and hobbles around and then he pulls out his laser sword and he jumps around like a kid and is really powerful. And then when he finishes, he's all tired again. He goes back to using his cane again. I thought that was a, an amusing idea that you have this sort of Clark Kent. Only in this case, it's, a, it's an old green 800 year old wizened Jedi master who walks around one way, but it actually underneath is very powerful. Once ILM got in there and they started to do the cloth simulation and the other things, it really made it a powerful sequence. And ultimately, I think it's just the look on his face that really makes it all credible. And it's an interesting uh, sequence ultimately because uh, I had to create a situation where all the Jedi lose, you know, and the Sith gets away to fight another day. <laughs> because this is a continuing series after all. Um, so it's a hard kind of ending to have everybody lose and still hopefully have a, a satisfying end, ending to the movie. And the real issue is, is that the Sith, the Sith Lord gets away in the end and our guys aren't completely destroyed. But it does make the bad guys very formidable. You know, it doesn't have the, the normal ending. We do kill the one bad guy, which is our friend Jango Fett. Uh, so there is that kind of comeuppance in the end for the bad guys, but uh, the, the really top bad guys get away just as Darth Vader did in uh, episode four. We have to strengthen the Jedi, and I had to set up the fact that they were gonna have to lead the Clone Wars into battle as we get into the middle of the Clone War here, that they were gonna continue to have to work with the clones, and that's an essential part of where the story is going. And so while we don't say it's the beginning of the Empire, it's implied in the power that's been given to uh, the Grand Chancellor Palpatine, and, and it turns into it. And then that is contrasted with the idyllic situation on Naboo where uh, Anakin and um, Padme are getting married in a what will be a, a doomed relationship, which they have already stated earlier on is, is not gonna work. But they do love each other. I mean, they're truly in love with each other, and it's the issue of true love over duty. It's really the, the Romeo and Juliet aspect of it, of a doomed relationship in more ways than one, really. You know, she married the wrong guy. This marriage uh, will end up with, you know, the birth of their children, which go on into the next trilogy. <laughs>